with a view to a kill. Uh, how was Roger Moore told that he would not be in the next Bond film, that he would no longer play James Bond? Did he really offer to go to a surgeon and have some operation to look younger? Do you know that? I don't, but I'm sure that uh, Roger had a bit of surgery done over the years, <laughs> as most actors do, you know. You, uh, he, uh, Roger was getting on the way. Uh, when, I, when I was asked to direct a uh, few hours only, um, already my first brief from Cubby Broccoli was to find a new James Bond. And uh, Roger Moore, uh, at that time, he was going to be replaced. Uh, if you look at the uh, opening sequence of Your Eyes Only, uh, you'll notice that I, 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 I wrote a scene to uh, replace Roger, and uh, there was the gravestone of his wife, Tracy, in, uh, in the graveyard at Stoke Proges, quite close to um, Pyman Studios. And uh, uh, I, I designed that scene, really, just to get a continuity for a new James Bond. But it worked so well as a, as a piece for the script that when eventually Roger did re-sign to do Bond, uh, thank goodness he did, uh, from my point of view, um, then I kept that scene and we used it as the pre-title scene, um, which was quite amazing really when you think that at that time, um, the kids' toys, um, I was walking around the studio on a Sunday and one of the um, Carpenters was working on the Sunday. He brought his small child in, and uh, we nearly tripped over a, 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 a remote-controlled car, which was quite new at that time. And uh, the kid was racing this car around outside the stage at Pinewood, and uh, that gave me the idea for the the opening sequence in Pure Eyes Only with the remote-controlled helicopter. Uh, so you get these ideas, they come in a flash, and then you can develop them. But, um, so, so, Roger, to answer your question, <laughs> um, R Roger, um, I'm sure, did have a bit of surgery done over the years. But not very much, but um, probably had his eyebrows. He <laughs> 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 had over overactive eyebrows as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, which was quite useful sometimes. And, um, in, in the little film we used to make, called the Wanker film, uh, I used to cut out all the eyebrow raises and, and orchestrate them with machine gun fire because he blinked every time the gun went off. Um, Roger was kind of, uh, you had to be careful sometimes. He wasn't a particularly athletic person, although he always wanted to do all his own stunts, but of course, you can never let, allow them to do their own stuff. So um, yeah, he was um, he was very enthusiastic. It was a lot of fun. We all loved him dearly, and we, we miss him dearly. That's true. Let's stay with uh, for your eyes only for a moment. Bernard Lee, the uh, actor who portrayed M, he died during production. Um, were scenes filmed with him before his death? For your eyes only? Bernard Lee was one of those great characters. He was really a wonderful actor. And uh, my first experience with Bernard Lee um, was um, uh, on The Third Man, of course, where he played the sergeant that gets shot, I think, in the, in the, um, in the sewers in Vienna. And um, he was a, one of those wonderful characters. He had a, he had a, a, a rather bent elbow, I'm afraid. He quite liked to drink. And um, the, the assistant director's job, first thing in the morning, was to find out where Bernard Lee had hidden the booze <laughs> in his dressing room. Because otherwise, after lunch, you couldn't, you couldn't. I mean, he, he managed, he had a kind of a, a technique of able to get speak his lines. Well, although he was sort of half inebriated, um, he, he managed to get his lines out. He was such a beautiful actor, wonderful man. And, such a generous man, um, and on that to your eyes only, it was obvious that he was he was dying. He was um, very ill, and uh, he was the first to say that you know he couldn't do it. So we knew we had to replace him, um, which was a great shame because he was one of those great characters in the Bond films. That's true. Uh, 
Staying with For Your Eyes Only, we saw it yesterday a bit, uh, the scene where Roger Moore kicks the car over the cliff in Corfu. Um, I would like to uh, have a bit more information on that, on that discussion you had with Roger. He was very unsatisfied with um, how Bond, or he himself is portrayed, he said to children, watch my films and I want, don't want them to see a Bond who is like that. Can you go a bit more into detail how that discussion between you and Roger unfolded? Yes, it was, a, it was one of those things, um, like most actors, they, they kind of read the script uh, in a very cursory way, but it isn't until the night before the shooting that they actually study the, the actual page they're going to be shooting the next day. Mm. So invariably, the, uh, the day of the shooting, that you get this uh, onslaught from the actors about the, the lines, the dialogue, uh, they want to change everything, and uh, you have to have a kind of a discussion without getting too upset about Sometimes you can adapt the dialogue to suit them without it really changing the story. But uh, the important thing for a director, of course, is to keep the narrative strong. And I usually say to, um, to Roger, you know, that we've spent six months perfecting this script with very good writers. You know, uh, I think that, um, you know, the end result is that um, they're right and you're wrong, basically, but you don't put them in that term. Um, so, yeah, we had a discussion, and um, he said that, uh, you know, he said, lots of children see my films, and uh, I don't, it, it's not in my character, in a way, to, to uh, kick this car over the cliff. And uh, I disagreed with him, and uh, I said, no, I, don't, I think you're quite wrong, Roger. I think this, this man, killed your best friend and in Cortina in a, in a foul way and uh, he deserved everything he gets and I think now you, it's not in your character as a personality but I think as a James Bond it's in your character to get him off the cliff and uh, he, he eventually said okay and I kind of compromised to a degree I mean I used the little dove emblem which he wanted to use as being the, the tipping point that knocks the car over the cliff. Um, but I said, we'd, we'd do that and we'd kick as well. <laughs> of course, uh, at the end of the day, uh, I got the power in the editing room, so that's the way it was. <laughs> <laughs> what did Covey say to that? Or did you say, oh, let them fight? Covey just let us get on with it. He, he quite enjoyed it. He just, just smiled as he did. And, uh, he always encouraged us to have a little discussion, and uh, he used to quite enjoy it. I think he agreed with my decision. Did, was Roger involved a lot in changes in the scripts of, of the films he directed and did together with him, or was that the only no. occasion? No, I think Roger was a very sensible <coughs> actor. He was also a very good director. So he was well aware of the problems that the director faces. You know, he worked for a long time on the script. I mean, the time frame of a James Bond film was basically two years between movies. And of that time, you would spend at least six months and probably nine months working on the script. And you start with a blank piece of paper and you develop the script. And it's a great fun experience. I tell you, I just used to love that. And the arguments, you know, with Richard Maybaum and Michael Wilson, uh, the arguments we used to get into because Richard Maybaum used to be an actor when he was a young man and always the heroine in the, in the film was always his wife. He, he had a, a, a beautiful Austrian wife and um, she was getting on for 70 I think. But she was a lovely lady, there's no doubt about it. And Dick Maybaum, when he was making his point and he was trying to sell the idea uh, of this Austrian princess, he would get down on one knee on the floor and make an impassioned uh, actor's plea for us to use his idea. And we would roar with laughter because it was so funny. And uh, Covey used to fall off his chair with laughter. It was, it was so funny. To, and, uh, but it was all done in great humor and great, you know, we got on very well as a team. And uh, at the end of the day, we go and have dinner or lunch or whatever it was. And um, we all be great friends. Um, going to Octopus, uh, Stephen Burkhoff 
who played General Olof in Octopussy, uh, is quoted in saying he thinks that Bond films are low quality entertainment and not really up to his style. Uh, did you get any feeling of him on set that he did not really like what he was doing there? Well, Stephen, Stephen Burkhoff is, uh, is rather, shall I just say, he's w rather weird, <laughs> to do it that way. Uh, he's fringe, very much fringe theatre. He's a very talented writer. Um, he's, he's done some wonderful, written some wonderful plays, and uh, I've been to a one-man show where he's, a, he's quite a good mime artist. And uh, I think it's Met Metamorphosis um, was, a, was a play that uh, Janine and I went to see um, when I was just before I cast him. And in, in Metamorphosis, there is a, a, a time in the play where he takes on the persona of a mouse. And believe it or not, as you watch the, him on stage, he transformed his appearance to that of a mouse. Mm -hmm. he had, he, he used a little device, he had two little teeth that came out of his mouth. But he did, he actually had that wonderful ability that mime artists have to transform themselves into somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that way he was very talented, but he, he was weird. And uh, he, he would, um, the first take, the first rehearsal we did of the big scene with General Orloff and, uh, you know, talking about uh, invading Western Europe and all that stuff, which is kind of a scene. And Peter Lamont, the um, production designer, he built this beautiful set with a revolving podium with all these, the head of the, uh, the president of the, the, of the Russia and everyone else all moving around and wonderful images being projected. Uh, it was a really, it, I was so impressed when I saw it, the set. And um, so were the actors. And Stephen Burkhoff, his eyes lit up when he saw this wonderful set. And of course he went way over the top. And then um, General Gogol got up, and because he was, Burkhoff was that so over the top, he became, he did also over the top. And all these <laughs> actors were doing these terrific over, over the top experiences. And I was falling about with laughter. And uh, the continuity, uh, Elaine Strake, uh, the continuity girl, her nickname was the Duchess. And she took me to one side, she said, you've got to do something about these guys. They're crazy, they're over the top. And I said, this is a James Bond film. And I said, you've got to have a certain amount of over the top. And, you know, and uh, so I took them down a little bit. And I went up to Stephen and I said, uh, I said, very good, Stephen, but uh, just take it, take it down a little bit, a little bit. And he said, oh, do you want me to take it down a bit? And I said, yes, if you would. And then, of course, he took it down, and everyone else took it down a bit. And I think we got a kind of a nice uh, extrovert kind of performance, which you need. I mean, the guy was a madman in the film. So, uh, yeah, it worked. But uh, he, he is an odd, uh, a bit of an oddball. And I used him another, in another film later on. And, uh, he, he, I always remember it was like on a, a film set. I mean, nothing works. I mean, you know, the, the, the lift door sort of judders. <laughs> um, everything, and, you know, there's a prop man pulling the string somewhere in the background. And uh, he, he got very upset because the, the, on, on one of the takes, uh, the door didn't work properly. And he started leading off at the prop man. And, uh, I said, I took him to one side, said, Stephen, I said, this is, this, I said, uh, this is a film, you know, uh, the things go wrong all the time, just, just laugh about it, you know? and uh, he was okay then, but you had to, you had to talk sternly to him, you know what I mean, you couldn't let him get away with it, otherwise he'd run you riot, run you ragged. Especially with Roger Moore on the set, I imagine there was quite a bit of humour, and he always made jokes on crew members and everything. Was there ever a time where you said, "Okay, I have to I have to go to another room and just laugh for a few minutes, do not disturb the actors"? No, I think with Roger, um, everyone loved him so much, and uh, he would come on a, on the set in the morning, and uh, the first thing he would say was. Uh, Everyone, everyone who had it off last night laugh, and of course, everyone laughed. And 
that was the start of the day with Roger. He was, he was always cracking jokes. And, um, and I encouraged it. I mean, we kind of about half an hour a day for Roger's gags <laughs> on the schedule. <laughs> Uh, staying with Octopussy, going from Steve Berghoff to the finished film. Uh, you saw uh, the trailer of Octopussy when you were on holiday. And you decided to go back and recut the film, re-edit the film. Well, Why? Not, not so much the film, but it was just the opening. You see, uh, Morris Binder used to do a, a trailer, come in this summer, the Bond extravaganza, what have you. And I happened to be with my family on... Uh, on a weekend holiday um, down at the south coast and uh, it was raining as it usually does in England yeah. <laughs> and uh, we decided to go to the cinema and showing was Maurice Binder's trailer for coming this summer and I'd previously um, been a bit nervous about the line at the end of the pre-title sequence where the BD jet comes into the petrol station and Roger says fill her up and I didn't think the line was going to be that funny. So I cut it out of the cutting copy uh, at the studio. And of course it came up on the screen and the line was in the trailer. <laughs> Fill her up please and the audience fell about laughing. So I thought, all right, that's a lesson for me. I'll go back, <laughs> I go back on the Monday morning uh, to the studio and put it straight back in the film again. <laughs> Octopus is, of course, the film with the most Bond girls, I think, if you count all of uh, yeah. Octopus's girls. Uh, which, of course, raises the question, many girls and Roger Moore, did Roger Moore have any say in uh, casting the girls? Or? No, not at all. Um, I would have a, a casting session where uh, the casting director would bring in every, you know, maybe as many as 80 models, you know, the top top looking girls of the day. And, and I must say, <coughs> excuse me, on Octopussy, um, we had a, a fantastic crop of girls, really good looking girls. And um, they'd come, come in the office and we'd spend all day and I'd have to make notes about the girls, you know, uh, their qualities. Um, so I could remember them because after you've seen about a dozen girls, one girl kind of bleeds into another girl, you know, and you, at the end of the day, you can't remember which one was which. So I had a sort of system where I used to rate them. I used to give them marks out of ten, and uh, then I would sort of change it and, and select someone and then put a cross through when someone better came along. And we, we picked them for personality as well as looks. Uh, but, of course, the physical attributes was very important in the Bond film. Um, you know, it's part of it, more so then than probably than now. Um, you know, people expected the most beautiful girls to come um, to come on, on the screen, and um, we on that particular film we we had a we really had a feast of girls on that one, and uh, the the um, location in India lent itself somehow to a romantic uh, background, particularly uh, the love boat. Um, I don't know whether it's crossing one of your next questions, but um, we, we have resurrected a, a boat on the lake at Udaipur in India. And uh, all the women were women rowers because it was a woman's island. And uh, because we had these beautiful girls all rowing this boat, of course they couldn't row for toffee. Um, <laughs> but um, we, we had a, a, a little engine concealed at the back and uh, then we got a, a very macho woman um, to uh, say in, out, in, out. Of course, that's well, Bond is making love to the girl in the back. <laughs> so uh, it was, it was fun. We were, you were tongue in cheek all the way, and uh, very, very beautiful place to die for, and it was absolutely perfect for making a movie. You know I mean, you know, everything was there within two or three miles. Wonderful. And the change from Roger Moore to Timothy Dalton for The Living Daylights, did you have, have any say in choosing the next actor to take over from Roger Moore? Absolutely, yeah, because I'd already um, tested Pierce Brosnan, which I, who I recommended to Cubby. Um, Cubby was a little reluctant about Pierce because he'd been in that um, 
series um, in uh, America, uh, quite a successful TV series. Remington Steel. Remington Steel. And um, he was still under contract to marry Tyler Moore. It was an option. But she already said they weren't going to continue with Remington Steel. And uh, so I tested Pierce, um, did fantastic tests. Three, three days we spent testing him. And uh, we, I cut the stuff together, a fight scene, a love scene, all classical scenes from the Bond films. And uh, most of which have been performed by Sean Connery in earlier films. But we just got the, the old pages of the script out and we resurrected them and Peter Peter Lamont built some beautiful sets and uh, yeah, we spent a lot of money on it and um, we sent the stuff to America, they approved him and uh, next thing is Mary Tyler Moore has got wind that uh, Pierce is going to be the next James Bond so of course she renewed his contract because mm. she wanted James Bond and Remington Still yeah. and of course that was a deal breaker for Cubby Broccoli he said no way so we lost Pierce at that time um, which is a shame, really, because um, he was a very good choice, I thought, and a uh, very nice man, and I knew him quite well. I'd, m I'd met him before. So I was cheated, in a way, of, of using him in my next film. But uh, we had a discussion about it, and Timothy's name came up. I think I suggested it. And Cully said, well, we did consider him many years ago after he'd done Lion in Winter, and he was really top of the tree at that time. And uh, now I don't think uh, life had dealt him too many good cards in terms of films, and he was more uh, agreeable to uh, appearing as James Bond when we approached him. And uh, we had a meeting at Michael uh, Wilson's house in Hampstead, and uh, he said he agreed he would do it. And uh, we didn't test him, and because uh, he was such an established actor. Uh, his acting credentials weren't in any doubt whatsoever. Uh, the only question mark is would would the women find him that attractive? Would that, would um, would he work in America? Would he? You know, mm. um, it, there's a lot of considerations to be made. He hadn't been re he hadn't really established in America, so um, that was a little question mark. But uh, in the end, we were pushed for time. Uh, there weren't that many other options about, quite honestly. I tested several, quite a few um, actors, Australians, Americans, you name it. And uh, we hadn't really come up with anyone. So Timothy really was our best bet. And um, so that's where we signed him up. And uh, I think he signed up for three films for quite a bit of money, I think. Um, <laughs> Quite a bit of money, not for the sort of money they're paying Daniel Craig, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, he was, and I think it was fantastic. I, I think uh, in a, the, the particular um, the film, uh, Living Daylights, um, it was a very good film. I mean, uh, we we shot uh, it went to Austria, and I, it was like renewing my. Um, I passed in a way with the third man and that and the streets. I did, I did consider tilting the camera and, and I decided against it in the end because um, I think Carol Reed used that tilted camera technique because they were all wearing trilby hats. Mm -hmm. And you've got someone wearing a hat, trilby hat. You, you can fit it into the frame better if it's at an angle, you know. Mm -hmm. Because you're talking about a, quite a, a wide screen. Uh, narrow headroom, so you're better off to uh, it, tilting the camera is quite a good technique. Uh, I used it on on Danger Man when uh, we were always having sort of like wider sets with aerials that go up, and of course if it's if you just do it as a straight shot, the aerial's gone. At the moment you do that, it's gone out of the top of frame. Uh, so I used to use the tilt the camera and use the angle from corner to corner gives you more more room. So all these things have got a practical uh, background really. But um, no, he was, um, I was very pleased with uh, Timothy. He wanted to go back to the, the Fleming hard-edged Fleming style. And uh, I agreed with that. We all agreed that, we, you know, we couldn't uh, ask him to com copy uh, Roger because uh, Roger was unique. He was a personality actor. More than a, he had a very poor opinion of his own acting ability, Roger. He was very modest. 
I used to have to continually reassure him that he was a good actor, you know. <clears throat> but uh, there was no doubt about Timothy. You know, he was a Shakespearean actor. Who was, uh, he might have been t too good an actor, really, for James Bond, really, thinking about it. But uh, he's very similar to Daniel Craig. And I think, really, he was before his time, in a sense. But I was very happy with him. And after License to Kill, the Bond franchise sort of went into a six-year hiatus. There was no Bond film. Yeah. There were complications. Yeah. But uh, Timothy Dalton was still on board. He was still under contract for a third film that did not come. But when did you learn that uh, you were no longer a director of the Bond franchise? And with what, um, what did they tell you that they want to replace you? With what reason? Uh, it's funny, really, but. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the, the Bond uh, family, Cubby and his wife and Barbara and Michael Wilson, his son-in-law, uh, they're very much a family and they're very, very nice people. And I got on very, very well with them. And um, uh, we had a very good stunt arranger uh, called Bob Simmons, who had been on all the Bond films from Dr. No onwards. And he was a, a terrific um, servant of the company in a way. You know, he was always there and he was a very good stunt arranger. Unfortunately, he, again, uh, the drink got the better of him as he got on the bit, you know. And uh, we were, we went to, um, I was doing some tests, I was testing the girls, and I got a stock actor in to play James Bond, and dressed him up in his dinner suit, and what have you. He was just a stock actor, he was never going to be James Bond, but I was testing the girls. And uh, in the middle of the test one day, the door of the stage opened with a big loud clang right in the middle of a take I was doing. And I sort of half looked round. And Bob Simmons came in supported by one of his friends. And he was absolutely drunk. And he came in and he said, you never make a James Bond. <laughs> you know, and I just carried on and finished. The, of course, Barbara was on the set. She was an assistant director then. And she was <laughs> straight to the office to Cubby and told him what had happened. So, of course, at the end of the day, I go into Cubby's office and he said, uh, well, John, he said, you've got to get rid of him because you can't have him in charge of actors and all that sort of stuff. So uh, I said, Cubby, I said, he's been a fantastic servant of the company. OK, he's, he's, hit, the, he's hit the skids now. But, you know, I think you should, talk to, you should give him the news that he's no longer on board and all that. Oh no, he said, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I called Bob into the office and he was sober now, of course. I think he knew what was coming. And, uh, and I, said, I said to him, you know, you know you, you've been a fantastic servant of the company and we're very sorry, but I'm afraid the time has come. You know, you're gonna you know, have to be replaced. And he, was, he took it very graciously, I must say. And I said to him, I tell you what, Bob, you're a fantastic horseman. You're wonderful with horses. And on uh, View to a Kill, we're going to have lots of horses for all the Shanti sequence. Would you like to take care of the horses, uh, the job, like the manager of the horses? And he jumped at it. He said, yes, I would. So I kind of chickened out a little bit, I gave him another job, you know. <laughs> but it was a nice thing to do because he died a year later. And, uh, you know, it, to, to have just thrown him to one side, it would have been very hard, I think. And not, not in our character as a company. You know. So that was, that was the, uh, the point. But, uh, so I'm coming round to how it happened to me, because when I discussed this with uh, Michael Wilson, I said to Michael, I said, when my turn comes, to be pushed to one side, if you like. Uh, I said, I hope you call me in the office and give it to me for man to man, you know? And he laughed at me because it was some distance off before that was going to happen. But I said that, and, uh, and uh, he kind of uh, took that on board, I think. But um, the, what you have to say is that I was never, ever permanently employed. I mean, I was employed film to film, so I never expected after having finished For Your Eyes Only, I never expected Cubby to turn around and say, you know, would you do Octopussy? Which he did. Mm -hmm. And I jumped at it, of course, because I loved it. And then, of course, it happened again. It happened five times, which is 
you know, a, a world record. I doubt if it will ever be beaten. Um, but um, it was, um, Cubby, I got a call. I mean, it was six years. I've done other things, other films. And uh, Cubby called me from Los Angeles. And he said they want to make a complete change. They want to... Uh, they want to have a new director, a new star, uh, they want new writers, that, that everything was going to be turned up in the, in the air. And I think, I said to Cody, I think that's a very good idea. Uh, you know, I was saying this to help him, because he was such a nice man, and it was hurting him, you know, to, to have to tell me the news. And, uh, but I had such respect for him. I said, you know, great. I think it's a great idea. He said, well, I'm not too sure about that. I, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was it was a nice conversation, and uh, uh, you know, and I think it was the right thing to do because the series had a bit of a dip, but then it picked up again, and uh, then they got um, Pierce came back, and then uh, Daniel Craig came into the, into the scene. And uh, the, the series was very strong. I just hope that they keep the humour going because I think the humour has been a little lacking um, with Daniel Craig. But I, you know, he's made up for it in other ways. Um, very similar to Timothy Dalton's performance, I think. Um, nothing in it really. And uh, I think the last film, Spectre, I, I wasn't crazy about. I, I think the, the script was a bit. Um, a bit unfinished, shall we say. <laughs> but uh, and certainly I think they're aware that they need to bring the humour. But I don't think you can bring the humour back unless you change the bond. Mm -hmm. And I think they had a good opportunity this time to change the bond because they've got wonderful actors uh, in England at the moment, uh, you know, who, who are in a successful TV series um, who could easily uh, replace and they wouldn't have to pay him hundred million dollars or whatever that stupid amount they're paying him. <laughs> if it was my money, I would I would change. I would change. <laughs> so, you, so you clearly saw uh, the films with with Pierce Brosnan, and uh, the question is, of course, would you have pushed or driven the films in the same direction as uh, Martin Campbell took Goldeneye, which was very very dark and riding on the Cold War, last Cold War brawl. Yeah. Would you take, have taken the same direction in terms of storytelling and look of the film? It's very difficult to say, really. I think uh, Pierce Brosnan was more in the Roger Moore mold. Uh, he, he wasn't as hard a, a character as Timothy or Daniel, and certainly not as hard as uh, Sean Connery. But uh, uh, I think he could have handled the, the humor better, probably. Uh, so I would have I would have gone for more humour. All my all my films, you'll notice that uh, all the action scenes have well, a humorous. Uh, they're very exciting, and then at the end, there's a bit of humour which releases all the tension, mm -hmm. and that's the secret really of successful action scenes. So um, I would have injected more humour in, into the series. Uh, it wouldn't have been quite as serious, um, but. There it goes. I mean, you saw with Timothy Dalton, I mean, A License to Kill was a pretty hard film. I mean, it was, you know, but you had to take, stay true to the drug trade. I mean, they are vicious, these people. I mean, I, we, we made the film in Mexico and we saw some of what went on there, you know. Um, it's, it's a, they, they kill people's children and family, you know, just to make a point. Don't play with us, you know. Um, and it's a, a very uh, lawless, was when we made uh, License to Kill. Mexico was a very lawless place. I mean, they used to have machine gun attacks. <laughs> the the u different unions, the musician unions, shot up the Neco, Neco Hotel where the union was staying because uh, they had a dispute with another union. So <laughs> it was kind of a dangerous environment we were sharing. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Um, have the Bond producers, uh, Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson, ever contacted you again, or do you see them on some basis regularly? And do they ask for your opinion or your advice as a director or an editor? No, they, I would never offer my advice, and they would never ask it, quite honestly, because uh, that would undermine the, 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 the current director, whoever he was, and 
uh, the worst thing, I never went on the set. I've never been on the, I've gone on the set ever since I left the series because the moment I appear on the set, immediately they all think I've come to take over. You know? <laughs> uh, so I purposely kept clear of the studio. I wasn't going to undermine the, the, the director. And uh, that was out of consideration for the director. Um, I, as far as um, Barbara and Michael and Cubby, um, Cubby of course died and uh, I, was, I went out to Hollywood to, um, uh, to see him just before he died. He, did, he had had a, a huge uh, operation, a lung, a lung transplant. And, uh, he, you know, if, if, if it wasn't for the fact that he was so wealthy, you, you wouldn't have that surgery done. But you're in the hands of the medical profession who are making a fortune out of you. So they're going to replace every bit of your body they can, aren't they, to make some money? And so I, I, I always suspect that's what happens. You know, if you, it's a, thank God I'm not that wealthy. <laughs> but, uh, but, but you get cut up if you're not careful. <laughs> um, but um, what was the other part of the question, sorry? Um, Barbara and Michael. Keep Barbara, Barbara, Michael. Yeah, Barbara and Michael have always been very respectful of me, and I, I have them. Uh, I've never ever bad mouthed um, the, the series or um, said nasty things about any actors. I've never dreamed of doing that. And um, I, you know, I always support them, and they they do ask me now and again to, you know, write an article or to attend a, um, some kind of conference or uh, the introduction of a new director, for instance, Mike Laptit. Uh, they asked me to go up and introduce him, mm -hmm. uh, which I did, and. Uh, Michael, Michael Atkin was a bit uncomfortable, I could see that, because, you know, he was coming in and, uh, you know, and I, he, replacing um, me, uh, you know, and um, uh, Campbell as well uh, was, um, you know, a friend of mine, I know him well. Uh, you know, we, were, we get on well, and uh, they invited me to various things where they were introducing him to the press and what have you, and then, of course, we get invited to the some of the premieres, not all of them, but uh, uh, I think some of you guys probably went to the, uh, the, the big one at the Albert Hall, uh, which was a fantastic uh, premiere and a fantastic party afterwards, and I enjoyed that. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'll go, I'll go along, and uh, you guys are important, uh, are very important in, in uh, con the continuation of the, of the bond saga, shall we say, uh, you fellows, um, your enthusiasm and dedication and understanding of Bond is really fantastic. I'm, I'm always uh, amazed at how much you guys know about Bond, <laughs> what makes him tick. You probably know a lot more about him than I do. Uh, um, it's um, a question of perception, really, and it changes all the time, and I think Possibly that's the secret of their success is that they can put, can continually update Bond and take note of the current state of the world. It's in a pretty depressing state at the moment, let's face it. So I don't know how they're going to lift this next film up. I hope they do. Beside, you said they need to inject more humour into yeah. the Bond films. Mm -hmm. Do you have a specific wish for the upcoming Bond film, which we now have a date for, at least? I think they. I think, in a sense, uh, I would say they they've missed a trick in a way. Um, they had an opportunity to turn it up on its head and do something quite different. And I, I don't think with uh, Daniel they're going to have anything too much different. Quite honestly, uh, he's not a. Um, you know, you can write in a certain amount of humour, but um, when I think of think of Roger, uh, maybe I'm just thinking in the past too much, but uh, when I think of his spontaneous humour, uh, there was a little clip yesterday which typified um, uh, Roger Moore, was when I, I said to him, uh, he said, you're not serious, John, are you about me dressing up in a gorilla's outfit on the train, are you in Octopussy? <laughs> I said, oh yeah, I said, perfect disguise. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, when, uh, when the villain was uh, setting the, the atomic bomb to go off, he said the bomb will go off in four hours, 20 minutes, 
the gorilla looks at his watch. <laughs> <coughs> and he, he did it quite, in, quite instinctively, Roger. Just his, just his fun, sense of fun, you know. I didn't tell him to do it. It wasn't in the script. He just did it. <laughs> and we all roared about it. We all la fell about laughing. And I don't really do it again because it, we ruined it by all, the whole crew laughing. And we the of it. But that kind of gives you an idea of what, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's difficult to, put a finger on what it is, but it's kind of a, he's just a fun guy, and, and um, tongue-in-cheek. I mean, sometimes, uh, I mean, some of the things I put into that film were straight out of Keystone Cops, you know, <laughs> like um, uh, the machine gun, machine gun in the um, Mercedes car uh, tires and uh, swerving onto the railway track with the, with the Mercedes mm -hmm. and going along, and of course, you have to meet a train coming the other way, then. <laughs> um, so all those things uh, I wrote in and developed those scenes and uh, Roger's eyebrows went higher and higher when he read it. You know? <laughs> <coughs> but uh, he was, he was a, you know, he was just a fun guy and uh, he never considered himself to be a serious actor. And uh, one morning I came in and uh, he said, I had dinner with, um, with a writer friend of mine last night, he said, and, uh, we rewrote this scene. You know, I said, oh, really? He said, he, said, uh, he said, have a read of it. And he'd written it all out. Um, Brian Forbes was the writer in question. And uh, I read this scene, and he had his hair and makeup guys who he, he employed, so they were, had allegiance to him. And they were all smiling and laughing at, you know, as I was reading this script. I put the piece of paper down at the end, and I said, Roger, Last night, after a few brandies, it probably sounded very good, but it doesn't stand up to the cold light of dawn. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, he just burst out laughing, Roger, so he accepted it, you know. But, um, you know, you, you have to stick to your guns. I mean, you spend all those months perfecting a, a scene. Uh, you can't throw it away on a whim. You have to, you know, then you lose control of the film. And, and it, it finished up being a disaster. And I think they started, re on the last Bond, they were rewriting, I heard, on the script. They were like rewriting as they went along. You can't do that. It's, it's a recipe for disaster. You have to have a plan and you have to go through with it. Um, so, you know, I hope they get themselves better organized. I, I don't know what the subject's gonna be for a Bond film next, next one, but um, I suppose there are, there's someone who'll come up with a good idea. I hope so. Yeah. Okay, a lot of you. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we open for audience questions. Do you need something else to drink before? Mm -hmm. Still coffee? Okay. I go around with the microphone. That's the easiest. You have mentioned a number of times that you were heavily involved in developing uh, action sequences, in inventing them, etc. On the other hand, uh, you have never been uh, basically named on the screen as a writer. So my understanding would have been there is the perfect script and then the director executed, but the way you describe it, you obviously develop the relevant part actually of the content. So how does that balance out? How are these things handled? So what's the story behind it? Well, I, I guess that um, I'm a bit old-fashioned in a sense. I think the director of a movie is obviously every aspect of that movie, right from the blank piece of paper to the finished script, to the actual shooting of the film, the casting, the music, and the post-production, the editing, and the final cut. It, it's all part of the director's uh, remit. So. Um, that, that was my understanding, and when I became a director, I didn't want to take anyone's credit away from them. Uh, I mean, you know, I was a pretty good editor, um, you know, on action stuff, particularly. And, um, you know, I, I was going to, I promoted my assistant as editor, but I wasn't going to take his credit away from him. I wasn't going to, you know, take his glory away. So uh, I think being director is is everything on you know, a film, you know, in terms of a credit. You don't need to steal someone else's credit, do you? Um, so so that, uh, maybe I'm just old-fashioned, but um, I, I just felt that um, that was part of my job. So Michael Wilson and, and Richard Maybaum, they used to 
they used to come to a sequence uh, uh, and they used to say, oh, there's an action scene, a chase, or whatever it was, and leave a blank. And then they go on with the next segment, the, the, the structure. And um, I would work in a separate room and I, I would try and think of some original idea for action that would fit in with the narrative. Um, and it's hard. It's really hard. And you're not on your own, in a sense, because you, you call in a, like a, an expert skier, someone like Willie Bogner. You know, maybe he'll come in and we'll talk about the sequence. He suggested, for instance, he said to me once, he said, oh, there's a, in Switzerland, he said, there's a lake. He said, where you can actually, you can ski, you can go down on a snowboard. This is when snowboards first came in. He said, you've yeah, got this new thing, this snowboard. He said, and we could do a snowboard scene where he cut, James Bond comes down and he hits this lake, which is water, you know, water. And he can, because it's a snowboard, he would go across the water where the skiers that are pursuing him would sink in the water, you see. I said, oh. Oh, really? I hadn't heard much about snowboard, so mm -hmm. I went into it and, you know, discussed it. But, and then I had then had to adapt that idea to bond escaping on a, um, a snowmobile and get shot up by a helicopter. And so I had to arrange it so that the front skid of the snowmobile becomes a snowboard. You see mm -hmm. how it works? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So someone gives you a, an idea and then you develop it. Uh, and that happens a lot, and um, you know, like B.J. Worth, all these parachutists and people, they used to say to me, oh, we used to have fun uh, coming back from a, a jump. Uh, we'd be in, the, in our jeep coming back, he said, and the buggers used to come out and pull the parachute cord, and we'd go out the back of the jeep as we're driving along. And I said, well, that's terribly dangerous, isn't it? And he said, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, that's how I, in, on uh, Octopussy, you know, the, that's how Bond escapes. He pulls the two parachutist things, you see, and they go out the back of the thing. Mm -hmm. That's how those ideas come about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you steal ideas from other people. It, 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 it's not the idea. They probably wouldn't recognize it. Mm -hmm. But um, you, you just, you know, you take a, 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 just a little gem of a, a thing and then you develop it in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm and adapt it to the sequence. So basically you get an action-free script and take care of the rest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, License to Kill, which some of you saw last night, um, that truck sequence is probably one of the most extended action scenes and the most difficult because the 27-ton truck and you've got people hanging under the wheels, uh, very unforgiving. Uh, one mistake and you had it, you know, and there's no... And Timothy was very, very brave, actually, because Arthur Worcester, my second unit director, I, I designed the whole sequence, and it, it, I had a room quite about the size of this room, probably, and the storyboards went all the way around the room. It was a huge sequence. And the Barbara Broccoli, uh, cut her teeth, was producer of that particular segment. Mm -hmm. And um, she went off uh, with Arthur Worcester. I spent down in uh, uh, Ruberoso. Uh, working with the actors, fitting them into the, the, the framework that Arthur had already shot. And uh, I had a, a, a Mexican uh, editor who I employed, a local guy who I employed, and he turned up with his girlfriend and they had a mobile cutting room, which was a truck. And when I arrived, I, I wanted to get the, um, to match into Arthur stuff, I needed a reference. So, I wanted to look at it. I had a flatbed in, the, in the, this truck. And um, I went down to find out where he was, and he was in a kind of a re quite remote area. And uh, I opened the back door of this truck. There was a big door there. And when I opened the door, and he was having it off with his assistant on the floor of this truck when I went in. So I said, oh, OK, I'll come back in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but um, that's how we did it. We, we had the references. Um, I did, we didn't use too much of this guy's editing in the end, but uh, uh, it was <laughs> that was Mexico for you. you know? <laughs> Next question is coming up. Yeah. Yeah.
enjoy it. Thank you for doing this talk. Um, my question is about Octopussy and the special situation in 1983 having... Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Yeah. Sorry, John. You're telling me to shut up, are you? No, no, no. no. no this gentleman's asking you a question at the Oh, back. sorry. Okay, I didn't hear. Where sorry. are you? He's in the back there. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, my, my question is about the special situation for the audience in 1983 having two porn films with Never Say Never Again and your Octopussy. Did it impact in any way your, your filming or your, your directing? Was there any tension or competition at the set? Yeah, it's interesting in 83 because... Um, uh, there was a second Bond film uh, with Sean Connery, which, you know, on paper looked a formidable kind of competitor, didn't it, with Sean? He was a fantastic Bond, there's no doubt about it. Um, but it didn't really affect us at all. Um, all I know is that um, I, I was about to leave for India on the initial recce, and uh, I, I drove into a car park in Audley Street, in the, the car park there, and. Uh, I had my script and my passport and everything in the bag in the boot of the car and um, I went into the office and when I came out my car had been opened up and the, the case, my um, briefcase with my script and my passport were gone. Now, I'm not accusing anyone of stealing our script, <laughs> but it did seem quite a coincidence. And they performed miracles in the office, and they got me a new passport, and I left the next day for India, for the recce. So they knew that they they knew what we were doing. We didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> uh, Barbara Carrera, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, the actress that they used, we'd actually already interviewed her, and uh, we decided, well, in Cubby's words, he he used to say Pasadena. You know, she was a bit too old. So we, we passed up on her, but uh, they used her. And um, it was, we, we didn't, the only other connection that, that happened was one day their rushes came to Pinewood Studios by mistake. The, the laboratory sent them to my cabin room. Uh, they got mixed up with which bond it was. <laughs> but I knew the editor on the other, I was, fr I was friendly with the editor on the other film and I gave him a call, I said, your rushes have turned up in my cunning room. I didn't look at them, I, I promise you I didn't. I wouldn't want to, you know? And uh, we even paid for the car to send them back to L Street. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, no, we, we had uh, good relations and uh, when the, when the time came to release our film, uh, they were supposed to come, come head to head with us and they lost their nerve and they, they delayed till Christmas and they didn't do anywhere near as well as we did. But uh, no, we, it didn't affect us at all, quite honestly. Um, Sean, of course, was credible, but he, he, he was past his best, I think, uh, by then. But, um, you know, we, we were doing well. Roger was great in the film. Octopussy was a very good film, I think. I mean, it was more humour. It was more comedy than anything else. <laughs> yeah, so that was that story of that. Have you seen the film after the release, the um, competition, Bond, Never Say Never Again? And what is your opinion about this film? Say that again, sorry. Uh, did you see the film right when it came out, Never Say Never Again? And um, what do you think about this film? just trying to think if I ever saw it. I think I did. Oh. I think I did. Um, yeah, I did. I, you know, I, I think it was okay. It, I didn't think it was anything particularly great, I must say. Mm. Yeah. And also, um, it was really funny because the director, I don't know if he ever directed another film afterwards, but he, um, he was saying he wouldn't, wouldn't direct another film uh, unless they paid him five million dollars or something, you know because he thought he was on top of the world for the, for the movie. Mm. But uh, in, a, in the event, it wasn't a great success. And uh, uh, I don't know whether, it, I think he probably did do another film, but uh, I can't remember it. <laughs> Somebody else? Somebody else? Maybe. Yeah, so if it's okay. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Sorry, um, my question is not about James Bond. I'm uh, to other uh, territory. Uh, you're the director of the former part of Iron Eagle, which I hold very close to my heart because of the first three who were all nonsense. 
uh, your, your movie uh, has a reputation, I think, about uh, Magnificent Seven, but only uh, reduced to four, under the um, leading of uh, Luke uh, Gossett Jr. Do you have every, any fond memories of that, uh, this little episode? Um. Anyway, I, I didn't that? hear that very yeah. well, but I'm sorry, I'm a little hard right. to hear. Um, to do with Aces? My wife, my wife heard that. Without the micro? Or she, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. To do with Aces, Iron Eagle. Oh, yeah. Um, it was like the um, last seven, day, seven Samurai, except you had four men with uh, Lou Gossett. Do you have any good stories about Aces? Because it's one of his favorite films. Yeah. Uh, Ace, Aces, Iron Eagle. Okay? Yeah. yeah. It was one of those uh, films that... Um, it was offered to me by Corelco, and uh, they, they were a quite a, a successful company on uh, Sunset Boulevard. And um, I got a call from my agent, and I went to see Ron Samuels, who was the producer. And uh, he'd previously made two films, Iron Eagle One and Iron Eagle Two, with Lou Gossett. Lou Gossett, a fantastic actor, he was Oscar-winning actor. He was absolutely wonderful. If you remember him, an officer and a gentleman, he played the sergeant major and what, but what a lovely man, um, absolute gentleman. And uh, I was impressed with him and uh, I said, yeah, I would do the film. I looked at the previous film, the first one was very good, but the second one was rubbish. And I thought to myself, well, I'd, I've got to do something um, special with this third one. So I put a lot of my input into into the script. Um, I did the thing with the aeroplanes, um, with um, uh, you know tilting the, the wing, to, you know, and he goes upside down and all that stuff. It was all kind of to get some humour and uh, excitement into the film. Um, now I said to him, I said to Ron Samuels, I said, how are you going to get uh, all the American Air Force to cooperate? Uh, and supply all the planes, all the jet planes, um, when they're running drugs. Are, are, the, are the American Air Force authorities, have they read the script? And he said, oh yeah, he said they've read the script. I said, do you think they're going to cooperate? He said, well, they said they would. I said, well, what happens if they don't? He said, we have to use the Confederate Air Force. And Jets, if, you, if you're <laughs> using jets, I tell you, they burn fuel like you wouldn't believe. And the budget was going to go right out of the window, you know. So uh, in the event, of course, the, the authorities, the army authorities of the Air Force, uh, they refused to cooperate, not surprisingly. And uh, so now we were, we, were, we were using the Confederate Air Force. <coughs> and um, we... we Get the, the, in America, flying is a lot easier than it is in Europe, but it's still expensive. And uh, I met some really interesting characters that own these: uh, the P-51, the Spitfire, a Zero. Um, you know that the, all these planes were held by private individuals, and um, we we did deals with them and uh, we we used them. But of course, Corelco. Um, were about to go broke, funnily enough. They'd been very successful, but they were, I didn't realize it, but they were running out of money. And um, the, the, the head of Corelco uh, called me in the office one day and I said, well, I said to him, when are we going to shoot this film? Because I've been preparing it for nearly a year. And uh, when I went there, I, I had a lemon on, the, on my desk, which I left there. And as, as the, the weeks went past, the lemon was getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> it finished up like a little, uh, little marble. And I said, am I going to make this film? You know, and I wasn't too worried because I was getting $3,000 a week expenses. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, it's not such a bad thing, really. <laughs> So uh, anyway, Janine was there and we, we bought an apartment in Los Angeles and, you know, we were doing very nicely. And, but uh, in the end, I thought, I'd better make this film, otherwise I'm going to be old by the time uh, we get to make it. So anyway, I went to see this producer and he said, if I wasn't pregnant with you and Lou Gossett, then I would we would cancel this film. That's what he said, those were his exact words. Because uh, we were both, Lou Gossett was on Pale Play. 
and I was on pay or play. So they were going to have to pay me whether I made the film or not, mm. and they were going to have to pay Lou Gossett a lot more than they were paying me. Mm. Um, and one or two other people, I think, were also on, on the same deal. So you had to make the film, and the original budget was $10 million, and I think it cost about 15 in the end, because we had to pay for all this fuel, which the, you know, the Air Force were going to provide initially. Um, and the, the other th bad thing was that we, Ron Samuels, <coughs> had a wife who he was trying to promote as she was a, a, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger, a female Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> And he'd not with it, with half the talent. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was trying to make her into a kind of a superwoman, if you like, of some sort. But I was on the hide into nothing. But um, no, it was it was we had fun with it, and I'd put as much humour into it as I could. And we had Chris Cap Cavan uh, Casanova, who was a friend of mine. I managed to get him on board, and. Uh, but all the time the budget was a problem, you know, we were shooting in Arizona and um, quite an interesting place to film actually. Um, it's full of um, uh, derelict aircraft, you know, where you, uh, they have these like airfields where all the, they got lined up, maybe 150 phantom bombers, you know, all in mothballs in, in a, on an airfield. Um, there was one, um, one airfield we used. Um, which was a CIA airfield where they used to do covert um, uh, runs into South America and do whatever they do, but I don't know what they do. But, um, and uh, there was one aeroplane <coughs> which we used, which no one owned. So we tried to insure it, and but when the insurance company said, who owns it? But we didn't know who owned it. No one, no one ever... It, the, the CIA used to use it for these, it was a short landing takeoff aircraft. So what I did was for the aerial scenes where they're being machine gunned by other fighters, um, I, I built up a ramp and I towed this aircraft up onto the ramp so that all you could see through the windscreen was sky. And then I had all the planes all coming down and um, with, with, you know, bullet hits and stuff. And we, we, that's the way we, we did that stuff, and we, we used this aeroplane, but we couldn't insure it. Um, but they, it was a strange situation, this, uh, this airfield. And um, the, um, there was one area, of the, one area of the airfield that we weren't allowed to film. We weren't even allowed to point our camera in that direction, and that was where they were um, experimenting with this new helicopter, the, the, I think they're called Black Hawks, are they, or something? They were very new at the time, and uh, they were doing all their testing there, and, but we weren't allowed to film there. Um, but the whole place was full of derelict aeroplanes who were all been mothballed. I don't know what they're going to do with all those planes, I'm sure. But there were also uh, Air Canada had all their Tri-Stars there, all mothballed. Um, Hundreds of aeroplanes. I don't see anything on the scale. Like what they ever do with that stuff? I suppose they get scrapped eventually. <coughs> but um, they took one off a seven, seven oh seven. Was that the early Boeing? Mm -hmm. uh, they took they took one of those off. Right there, and uh, the last communication they heard was it's show time as the guy was taking off, and he he plowed straight in the ground. D didn't ever make it. It was almost as though he was committing suicide. Was, while you were there, it was strange. Um, strange place. But they gave us fairly good cooperation. So we were able to do our flying scenes. Um, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was fun. I, I, I managed to get my cameraman, Alec Mills, and uh, I had uh, Johnny Richardson, my special effects guy, who was a fantastic guy with explosions. I mean, it's got wonderful explosions in that film. <laughs> um, very, very impressive. In fact, it, it, um, after that film, uh, he went to work for uh, Coralco on their remaining films they did, and uh, they, they thought the world of him because he was an exceptional special effects guy. I mean, his, his explosions were amazing. He was the guy who, who did all the explosions on um, License to Kill, and 
I used to joke every time I introduced to him, introduced him to anyone, I'd say he, he's the famous for his big bangs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What else? Anyone else? Um, yesterday, when we saw License to Kill, um, you worked with Benicio del Toro when he was there, very young. Now he's quite known as a very good actor. So I was wondering, did you discover him back then, or was he already working? Was it his first film? Um, how did you get to know Benicio del Toro? Yeah, uh, Benicio was very young. He was also he was a, a method actor. You know, he had to do everything for real. Very, very nice guy, a very good actor, but, uh, you know, a bit off the wall, if you like. <laughs> and, uh, he, I don't uh, know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> and we, had a, we had a funny, uh, Barbara Broccoli discovered him, actually, and uh, uh, also, I think, recommended by um, uh, Robert Darby, knew him. Uh, they used to hang out down at Santa Monica, and... Uh, Benicio used to go and take take food down to the down and outs who were sleeping on the beach there in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. He had a great social conscience, you know. He he used to go down and talk to them and take some food down. Um, and uh, he he was a very nice boy and uh, but a little undisciplined. <laughs> and uh, we had a scene where we he had the knife and. Uh, uh, Timothy Dalton is hanging by his fingertips mm -hmm. above that terrible machine that's mm -hmm. thrashing all the cocaine up and uh, he's being moved towards his death, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Benicia has got this knife and we had to use a real knife because, it, you know, the shine of the knife, we had to get the glint mm -hmm. of the knife and what have you. And of course, Benicia, being undisciplined, managed to cut, nearly cut Timothy's finger off. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so um, we rushed Timothy to the, um, to the, the to his dressing room and rang for an ambulance. And uh, the assist I said to the assistant, I said, "Well, the show's got to go on. Go and go and get Timothy's watch, his ring on his finger, all his stuff, his his hand dressing, so that we can continue with a double." <laughs> and the assistant looked at me and he said. No, no, no way am I going to go and ask for that. Is it? You're going, to, you're going to have to do it. So I had to go and personally go into the dressing room. And I asked Timothy how he was feeling, and I said, the ambulance is on its way. And I said, can I have the ring and the watch and that? And Timothy burst out laughing. He thought it was ever so funny. I, I had to go and get all the stuff so we could continue shooting with a double. But the show always has to go on, of course. Do you still have contact with Benicio? Or? I've seen him. I, I used him on uh, Christopher Columbus. Yeah. He was very good in that. He, he played the, the wayward, again, a wayward person. Um, and uh, he was very good, uh, I must say, at uh, what, what he did on Christopher Columbus. And I had Robert Darby. I use that. Uh, I, you know, I like to use actors I've used before that I know I can rely on. And Robert Darby was great fun. Robert Darby was um, <laughs> on Christopher Columbus. Well, we, I expect we'll be talking about that later, but uh, he, um, the producers were running out of money all the time. And uh, there was a stage when the actors weren't being paid. And one morning I had a call from Robert Darby. At uh, 7.30, I was about to leave for the location. And he said, John, he said, I've been on the phone to my agent in Hollywood all night. He said, trying to sort out this, he said, apparently we haven't been paid a penny. He said, and my agent said to me, do not go to work today. You know, if you go to work, you'll never get paid. And so I said, Robert, you're absolutely 100% right. Go back to bed, don't worry about it. So I went off to work and I got on the board and I had a cast of thousands, right, on Christopher Columbus. So I got his page, all Darvis lines out. I said, you take his first line, you take his second line, you take his third line, you take the fourth line. Do you know, within two minutes, Robert Darby was on the set. <laughs> <laughs> and I used that, I used that technique quite often in my career. Because, and, um, I had a similar thing with um, 
uh, Selleck, mm -hmm. Tom Selleck, and uh, he called me to his room when Marlon Brando didn't turn up on the first day, <laughs> and uh, I'd already anticipated he wouldn't turn up. <laughs> You have to be uh, you have to be pretty clever at the times. Um, <clears throat> so I cast uh, a good friend of mine as his stand, as his sidekick, as his assistant. So when when he didn't turn up, when um, what's the name didn't turn up, I I gave this guy all all of Brando's lines, you see. And of course that all gets back very quickly. And I kept him in a corner so he was separate from everyone else. And then I shot with Tom Selleck and the Queen of Spain and everyone else. And managed to do a day shooting, which you have to do on that schedule. Anyway, that evening I got called into Tom Selleck's um, dressing room, in, into his uh, hotel suite. And uh, he said, John, he said, I great admire your work and I've you know, always wanted to work with you. And that. he said, but the only reason I did this film was to work with Marlon Brando. And if Marlon Brando isn't going to be in the scene, I'm, I'm going home. I'm going back to America. I said, Tom, it's been wonderful knowing you. <laughs> Good luck in the future. <laughs> you know, and uh, I'm sorry it's not worked out. And, what's that? and I left. <laughs> Next morning, they all turned up. Marlon Brando, <laughs> Tom Sack, everybody. And we carried on for the scene. You uh, made him an offer you couldn't refuse. <laughs> But uh, I found that was the, the best thing to do always. It's just whatever the situation is, you just say, you just embrace it and say, fine, get on with it. Was Marlon Brando really this? He was lovely. He was really, he was really nice. Uh, I was terrified when, you know, it was a, it was a last minute bit of casting and it was done to try and uh, sell the film to the Far East. To have Brando in the film because he's a huge name. And, um, I was, I quite honestly, I thought to myself, how am I going to handle this, you know, it's, you know, I've got this reputation of eating directors, and, oh, I, 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 so anyway, um, I, my assistant, Brian Cook, he said, that, oh, Marlon's in his ca caravan, oh, I said, uh, is he in makeup? No, no, he does his own makeup. I said, what about costume? He said, oh, he's got his own costume. <laughs> so I said, I better go and see him. So I went into the, uh, we were already in shootings and stuff, and I went into his caravan. He had this caravan on the set, and, uh, oh, John, I met him for the first time, and he was very affable, he was very nice, and he said, he started talking about coffee. Uh, there was terrible coffee in Spain, and uh, he brought his own machine, and he was going, uh, you must have a coffee, John. And I'm looking at my watch. I'm thinking, I've got to get on with this bloody film. I'll never make it. You know, it's all very well uh, reminiscing about coffee and that. But, so anyway, I spent about half an hour talking about coffee, and uh, <laughs> and then I said, you know, we, we really ought to get going. And, uh, and he said, oh yeah, you've got these ideas about uh, about the nails. He wanted to have long, long nails. I said, well, have you got the nails? He said, no. I said, well, we won't have any nails in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, what about the costume? He said, this is it. And it was like a sack that went over him. And he was very, he was very huge. <laughs> he was a big man. He must have weighed about 26 stone. That doesn't mean anything that you guys tell you. He must have weighed 250 pounds. He was, he was huge. And, uh, but very charming. Oh, was he charming? <laughs> and I, I developed a nervous cough, you know, I tell you, <clears throat> you know how you do that, you know, when you're nervous, you, you cough. And he said, you know, John, he said, it's, it's Madrid, he said, it's the, the dry air in Madrid, he said, you're 6,000 <laughs> He said, uh, he said, um, yeah, he said, uh, uh, don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll sort something out for you. I thought, what the hell's that? Anyway, when I got back to my hotel suite that night, uh, there was a humidifier that had been delivered from London. <laughs> he, had, he, had, he had it flown in that afternoon. The, the plane arrived. They got special delivery, this humidifier. It was in my room. I plugged it in, switched it on, and it blew up. It was, <laughs> it was a wrong voltage. <laughs> so he said to me, yeah, I, 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 I rang him up and said, that was very, very kind of you, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, to send me this humidifier. I said, it's... 
He said, has it improved? I said, yeah, I'm feeling much better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, he, he, he quite fancied my wife. You know? <laughs> and uh, I cannot tell you what it was like uh, with the, the paparazzi with Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. They were like a hundred strong. And you go down, drive down the motorway with them, and we're surrounded with, with paparazzi on motorcycles taking pictures, and we're doing 80 miles an hour, and they're swerving in and out, and the whole thing, and they just do anything to get a picture of or anything. So when we were shooting, um, I used to put these big screens up. I got the electricians to put these big black screens up so that they, they were perched on the rooftops with telescopic lenses, you know, taking pictures of it. And uh, it was quite amazing. And uh, we uh, protected them as much as we could. But as far as directing Marlon Brando was concerned, uh, it's not a lot one can do, to be quite honest. Um, we, we had this big scene, and uh, I rehearsed it. And I said, it'd be nice if you could just pick up the pace a little bit, because it was very, very slow, you know, big gaps between every line and that. And like a fool, I'm thinking that's his delivery. But what I didn't realize was he had a little um, receiver in his ear mm -hmm. and he had someone in the next room giving him the lines. <laughs> <laughs> so of course he had to listen to the line and then repeat it. So there were these big gaps, which in itself isn't a problem because you can fix that. So I shot it in such a way that I could remove all that stuff, all those gaps. But I did ask him, I felt a bit of a fool because I said the same, could you pick up the pace a bit? And he said yes, and, but he didn't. <laughs> so, but um, we couldn't use, really. He said to me, John, I'll be quite honest with you. He said, I'm only doing this film for the money. He was getting $20, uh, $20 million or something for, I don't know, 10 days or something. 10 days worth or something ridiculous. Um, he said, I'm only doing this for the money. He said, my, my children are up for murder. Los Angeles. And he said, no, I'm just paying the lawyers. It's just to pay the lawyers. So I felt sorry for him. But he, he was very nice. He was charming, wasn't he, Janine? Oh, lovely, yes. Yeah, he really liked Janine. <laughs> <laughs> I got very worried at one stage. <laughs> um, we had dinner one evening, and Janine had got a, you know, he was part Indian, mm -hmm. uh, American Indian. And uh, Janine had a, a, a Something she turquoise, bought, turquoise a turquoise, ring. which she bought in Arizona years before. And he spotted it straight away as being an Indian artifact. And cross it. And you, what did you say? No, no, he, he sort of grabbed it and said, you know, that's, that's lovely. Where did you get it? And I said, oh, I bought it in Canada. It was made by oh. Canadian Indians. And he turned around and he said, there is no such thing as Canadian Indian. <laughs> and I felt about this big, because you know, that was his whole thing, that they roamed and, you know, they didn't belong in one place. In one place, so, yeah. Very embarrassing. Yeah, but uh, yeah, apart from that, he was very charming. <laughs> <laughs> but a uh, lovely man, and I, I think, you know, I've got pictures at home, but I must have been really suffering on that film, because I look at the pictures of me with Marlon, and, <laughs> Marlon was getting on a bit, but my eyes, I've got these big bags under my eyes. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I guess, um, you know, you, t you take all that pressure, but uh, you, don't, you don't really, I mean, I just go along with it, I suppose, but it does have a, a, an effect on you, and, uh, you know, to keep the picture going, because uh, they kept running out of money. And uh, these guys were arriving from uh, Libya with dark, big sunglasses and <laughs> briefcase full of, dodgy money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that, it, was, it was a fun film in a lot of ways. Uh, Brian Cook, who was my assistant director, was a character. Uh, he was a complete alcoholic, <laughs> but um, a, a, a character. You're making uh, it sound like everyone in the film business is an alcoholic. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, Richard Burton was uh, as well. <laughs> I see you attract them. <laughs> Maybe they need a drink when they woke up. <laughs> but uh, the funny thing was that um, uh, Brian Cook was uh, arranging all the crowd. We had a, a big crowd, I think we had 300 <coughs> Maltese extras. Right? And they rounded up all the local people and 
dress them up in sacks and things, you know, as one would in 14, whatever it was. And um, uh, we had the three ships we built and were on the tank in Malta. Now, the tank was built for models. So, you know, it, the, if you look that way, you'd have Malta, Valletta would be in your picture. And if you look that way, there were all kinds of buildings in some village. So you had a very narrow angle to see. Um, you couldn't really move, you could, really couldn't move the camera very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I had to do was, I had to use sails, I had these supplementary sails on the ships, so every time a, a building came into view, I used to stick a sail in the, in the way, you know, so <laughs> you couldn't see it. And we, instead of moving the camera, we'd move the ship. <laughs> so it's was, it was quite difficult to do. Um, <clears throat> anyway, we, we got the scene where we had three ships moving across the... Johnny Richardson, again, was towing these ships. Uh, the cable was on the bottom of the tank. The tank was only about four feet deep. And uh, because of the galleons didn't have a keel, so they were very unstable. So if everyone ran to the other side of the ship, the bloody thing would turn over, you know. Or it would if it was enough water to turn over. Um, so you had to be careful how you balanced everything. And uh, they used stones as ballast and what have you. And anyway, the three ships are going to go out, followed by the one with, where the Jews are all being sent out as well. So there were four ships on this tank. And we set the shot up and covered up bits of the letter and what have you. Uh, so it took us about three hours to get everything organized. And I was about to shoot, and I said, there's something wrong. What is it? What is it? And Brian said, I said, look, I said, it's their teeth. I said, they've all got these shiny, mm. shiny white teeth. I said, this is 1492. Mm -hmm. I said, they'd all, they'd all have black teeth, rotten teeth, you know. He said, you're right, John. He gets his megaphone out. He says, hair and makeup. He said, go and put a bit of shit on these people's teeth. <laughs> <laughs> That was a sort of, uh, that was Brian, he was, he was a character. <laughs> anyway, the, um, we, 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 we succeeded um, in finishing the film. I, I don't think many people, quite honestly, I don't, can't think of any directors who ever finished that picture, but me, I just kept going somehow, <laughs> you know. Yeah, good. It was good fun. What was the reason because of um, Timothy Dalton's left the picture? Because you started Columbus with Timothy Dalton, oh. and then he left. Why? <coughs> well, um, when I was hired, Timothy Dalton was going to be Columbus, which is probably the reason they got in touch with me. They probably thought, you know, John's done two <coughs> films with Timothy Dalton, so he'd be on good relation, good terms with Timothy, so that'd be great. That'd be a great combination. On on uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, it wasn't the case. Um, Timothy Dalton didn't want to do another film with me. Um, <coughs> Timothy Dalton didn't want to do Christopher Columbus. He'd taken a million dollars or something up front. I said to the producer, I said, are you going to get your million dollars back? And he said, no, no, forget it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just, they just threw money away. I mean, he spent five million dollars promoting the film. And it was going to have another director. Um, it was going to have uh, Mario Puzzi was going to write it. And, you know, it was a very top-heavy thing. Five million dollars. He hired a yacht in uh, Monte Carlo and or Nice, and uh, you know, the film festival and promoted this thing at great expense. He had aeroplanes flying over with Christopher Columbus on it and what have you. Um, but in the event, suddenly. It became a, uh, Christopher Columbus became a bad word in America because they said uh, slavery. He, he introduced slavery to America, and he was responsible for whatever, all the bad things that happened. Suddenly, they cancelled the ships going into New York Harbor with a firework display, and all, you know that it was going to be a huge entry for the film, and it all went suddenly. It all went. So they were stuck with having spent all this money. And then suddenly there's Timothy pulls out. I'm I'm the only one left, you know. Yeah. I've left and I can't get an actor to play Christopher Columbus. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I knew of an actor called George Corifas. And when I mentioned to the old man, um, 
the producer um, uh, mentioned that, uh, what about um, George Corifas? He said, ah, George Corifachi. We call him George Corifachi. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so he said, he said where, where do we see this man? I said, well, I've got him in the corridor outside. <laughs> Uh, we brought him into the room. Uh, we were in Paris at the time, and Janine, we had dinner with him, and uh, Janine said, uh, "Do you come to Paris very often?" He said, "Paris, never been to Paris." But he was a, you know, a tax exile from everywhere. He was a Lithuanian, I think. Um, but he, he didn't uh, ever own up to being anywhere in the, on this planet at any time. But uh, sulking. He, he was a charming old guy. He was a he was a really little fellow, but he was um, he was dy he was a real dynamo, and uh, I quite liked him actually. And uh, he had his wife and his ex-wife present at this meeting, <laughs> and she obviously knew where the body was buried because she was still around. So she must have had some kind of handle on the finances. But um, the son Ilya, who was the producer of the film. Uh, apparently, he was um, he was the his was an immaculate birth. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> that's what that, that's what it, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, my good friend John Richardson uh, went. It was on Superman. I worked on Superman as well. But apparently, the head of the party there, she got up the ex-wife mm -hmm. and she said, "Yeah, my son Ilya, he." He, he was the result of an immaculate conception. Mm -hmm. uh, there was just a little dribble on the thigh. Oh, John, don't go to this. <laughs> well, apparently Ilya, the son, was sliding down the tape where he was trying to get out of sight. You know, he was so embarrassed. But uh, they, they're crazy lot of people, I tell you. Amazing. But um, funny. Because um, she turned up. She turned up with a young American writer in the Royal Monceau Hotel in Paris. And we were discussing, you know, the script and what have you. And uh, she said, I have an idea. I have an idea for the script. I've been working on it with this, my friend. She didn't introduce this guy. He was in a rank coat, I remember, a young American guy. And uh, uh, she said, I will, I will explain the, the story. Uh, there is uh, this Indian woman in this cave and she looks out and she sees these ships on the horizon passing by and she foretells what, she looks in the fire and she foretells everything that's going to happen. And I thought, well, she's going to foretell everything everything's happened, there's no need to make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I listened to this and uh, I thought, hmm, this is a difficult one. Yeah. <laughs> So I very slowly got up and I went over and I poured myself a glass of water, took my time, had a sip, walked back across the room and I said, do you know, that's one of the most beautiful stories I've ever heard, but it's not for this film. <laughs> and no one said another word. <laughs> it, was, it was a funny, but I must say, wherever we went, we stayed at the best hotels, flowers, all around new flowers every day in the in the suite. Everywhere we went, we were absolutely top class. Whether he ever paid the hotel bill or not is another matter. <laughs> <laughs> if you had the chance to reshoot a specific scene in one of your Bond movies, is there one that you would re reshoot? And if so, which one? Oh, I don't think I could go through all that again. <laughs> No, I think I, I think that what we did, we did, and uh, we were. I was very fortunate. I planned all our scenes, and uh, I had a very good second unit director um, in Arthur Worcester, uh, who I, I actually discovered. Uh, I worked with him on documentaries at the beginning of my career, and uh, I realised this guy was fantastic. He was he was a one man band. He's a bit like Carsten. Is Carsten here? Yeah. yeah. He's, he's a bit like Carsten. He's a one-man band. He does everything, and uh, he's resourceful. And uh, but he's, he, you know, he's strong. And uh, 
he, he's the last person in the world you'd ever think would be a cameraman after Worcester. He's got thick pebble glasses, you know. But he was a brilliant, brilliant cameraman. And um, I, I had experience working on documentaries with him. And uh, he had all his own equipment and everything. And, you know, he can go off anywhere on his own and he, he'd come back with the goods. And uh, I promoted him uh, to second unit director. And uh, I, when Cubby uh, Broccoli said, oh, who are you going to have as second unit director? So I said, oh, I've got this guy called Arthur Worcester. And then he said, Arthur who? I said, Arthur Worcester. He said, never heard of him. He said, what about we use so-and-so, so-and-so? And he quoted some of his old mates and all that. I said, no, no. I said, this guy is, I really need this chap. I said, he's the jewel in the crown as far as I'm concerned and that. And he said, well, we'll see about that. And that. So I had to work on him for a long time to get him to agree. So, he eventually agreed to meet Arthur, and uh, I was in the office one day, and uh, Barbara, Covey's daughter, came rushing in the office. She said, "There's there's this chap wandering, this dwarf wandering wandering around the corridor, tripping over everything, trying to stumble in his way around with his thick glasses, trying to find find your office." And the next thing is. There's a knock on the door, and Arthur comes in, trips over the carpet, <laughs> comes in with these thick glasses on, and Cubby looks at me as much as say, what, they brought him here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, don't go by appearances, uh, Cubby, this guy is, uh, is really good. Uh, anyway, eventually I talked to him, and he, he was very good, Cubby. He let me have my own way in the way in the end and Arthur did he, and he went on even after I finished on the on the films he went on carried on doing second <laughs> unit on the on the bomb films he was he was a terrific guy and uh, very self-sufficient and that's what I liked and he, you know he did anything he was like hangs off rocks and you know very daring because uh, of his doc documentary experience mm. so it was a great break for him and uh, um, and I was lucky that, to, to be able to get him, and because uh, he did all the the stuff when the in license to kill all that truck stuff, you know, which I worked worked out and uh, second unit, and we had a good relationship. I could communicate with him. That was great. Yeah, yeah wonderful, wonderful help. You don't do these films on your own. You have a lot of help from other people. Okay. Eine Frage noch, und dann würden wir gern rübergehen. <laughs> One question, and oh, then yeah. we would like to finish because of time and oh, yeah. okay. the okay. level of hungriness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. maybe, okay. maybe my answers are too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> we cling to your lips. <laughs> This is absolutely fantastic to have question. you here. Yeah. Uh, my question is, um, there are uh, many times where it's not clear that Roger Moore plays James Bond again, or, uh, so you have a lot of casting other Bonds, and we all know that um, in Octopussy, James Brolin was nearly casted because mm. Roger Moore didn't sign. Um, the same with Sam Neill, I, th I think, for um, Living Daylights. Can you tell us something about these two actors, and what would you change if you um, have them as Bond actors for the films? I think I was very fortunate that, uh, that Roger was a good poker <coughs> player, you know, because they used to, um, Cubby and uh, Roger used to play, play uh, uh, what's the game they used to play? Oh, backgammon. 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 And uh, they used to play for money, you know, quite big money, I think. I think at the end of the day they were more or less even, uh, but they were both big gamblers and uh, for high stakes where they had loads of money I suppose. But uh, uh, he, um, Roger, uh, used, um, used it as a, a, a kind of a ploy, he'd say I'm, I'm not doing the next one, I'm not doing the next one and uh, Cubby would say okay we'll start, we'll, we'll, find, we'll find another bond that, and he used to send me all over the world. Uh, trying to find a new James Bond, but what I didn't realise that I was just a pawn in the game because uh, they were, you know, it was a poker game basically uh, to try and keep Roger's money down, um, and uh, so I was like going off to Australia and America and testing guys, and it cost, cost probably cost about a quarter of a million dollars or something just to prove, a, just to be part of this poker game. But, uh, I, was, uh, I was the innocent person. I must have been quite naive. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, Roger always signed. Uh -huh. 
And I was very pleased that he did because it helped me a great deal. You know, being the first time director, it's good to have someone. And I think Roger, um, a spy who loved me, um, I think Spyro loved me. I was uh, Roger became quite fond of me because of the ski, ski parachute jump, and he loved he loved that sequence. You know the whole mm. opening of Spyro loved me, and Spyro loved me was probably Roger's best Bond, without a doubt. Mm. And he was of his most handsome, and uh, he re he really nailed the part. And, uh, Barbara Back, who was. Um, you know, it was a bit suspect initially. She was a, a small-time actress, worked mainly in Italy, uh, but she came up trump. She was pretty, pretty attractive, and uh, she did a pretty good job. But uh, of course, Roger was married to Louisa Moore at that time, and uh, Louisa used to hang around the set taking pictures all the time, which is a pain in the ass, really. But, uh, and. Uh, uh, Roger, she, she, you know, Roger didn't get on that well with Barbara Back. He used to call her Barbara Back to Front. <laughs> that was his nickname for her, but they, he didn't get on very well. But it was partly to do with Louisa. You know, she was, she used, she was pretty, um, she treated Roger pretty badly, I'd say, um, in front of other people, you know, humiliated him a bit. Um, so, yeah, that happens. But uh, it all ended well in the end, I think, apart from... Uh, and Roger went on to do some fantastic films for me and helped to establish me in the, in the part of the director, you know. I mean, you know, you need the cooperation of an actor, particularly on your first film. Um, you know, you're pretty exposed to... And if you had an awkward actor who was giving you a hard time, you could rather destabilise the director, <laughs> shall we say. Yeah. Yeah. But he had a great sense of humour, and that was what I'll always remember about Roger. Uh, but the question was um, of James Rowland, because he was very close to the James Bond for Octopussy, as I understand. So he had uh, rent a house in, in, in London to be there. Who he was that? Sorry, James Rowland. James, oh, yeah, yeah, it's but, true. James Brolin, very nice man. Uh, we, we never, I think James Brolin was a bit of a pawn in the game as well. Uh, I think he was brought in as a kind of a heavyweight. Uh, rival for the role, and I think probably Roger probably sat up when he thought you know, James Brolin was in town because he was a pretty formidable actor, and I did tests with him and uh, pretty good tests. You know, spent two or three days testing, him. and uh, he did, he did well. But somehow I don't seem it doesn't seem to work is it, with an American. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Bond role <coughs> it seems to be you're okay with a Scotsman or a Welshman. Um, and we're an Englishman, we've had those three. Irish. And an uh, Irishman, <coughs> and uh, also uh, Australian. Australian. <coughs> but uh, we, have, we have considered Frenchmen, and <laughs> we always use the Germans as villains. <laughs> 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 so, and the villain's car is always a Mercedes, black as <laughs>